So to kind of kick things off, I just want to talk about the International Year of the Reef, which uh, if you don't know, was 2018, um, a great year to start for the reef. Um, you know, I'm sure these types of things uh, really, really bring a lot of attention to, to the degradation that's going on in our reefs. It was kind of a red flag to us. Um, it was one of the contributing factors on why we even started this whole thing. So I wanted to shed some light or at least bring some attention to it as it's coming to an end and as we close out this uh, awesome year. Um, and rather than talking about anything bad that happened during the year, I really wanted to bring up a couple good stories um, about uh, 2018 and, and uh, some really positive stories uh, that occurred worldwide. Um, so if you don't know, International Year of the Reef uh, began in 1997. It basically has happened every 10 years, give or take. Uh, it happened again in 2008. And then in 2018, uh, the year, this, this past year, uh, where the goal is really just to bring attention to the, what's going on with the reefs, try to collaborate, try to bring in more partnerships, and really help to get funding out into areas where we need them um, to help uh, in, in coral reef restoration. So the, the, I wanted to bring up these three stories because I heard them throughout the year and they were awesome. I don't know if I gave them as much attention as they should, so I just wanted to talk about them because I also got a few questions about them um, over the year. So the first one, I really hope you guys can see that screen to the right. I'm sure it's flickering and I apologize. Um, but the first thing was about this, uh, the deep blue hole in Belize, which is actually one of my um, favorite dive spots in all of the world. And it's definitely on my, um, it's on my list of places that I wanna dive. Um, so anyone who isn't familiar with the deep blue hole is it's this huge hole in the middle of the ocean um, just off the coast of Belize um, and you know when you're diving in it and I'm gonna get a little geeky here but you dive down and around 40 feet you start seeing corals growing all over this kind of limestone shelf and you keep going down and you'll actually see um, at about 100 feet Caribbean reef sharks and crazy things like that um, you keep going a little bit deeper and whether or not you have the, the good gas or not but you might get some nitrogen narcosis so you start feeling a little bit drunk and I'm getting a little deep here literally and that's when you start to see these insane stalactites uh, hanging from the ceiling of this cave at about 140 feet so you can imagine that this this marine environment is just absolutely spectacular um, and it's totally worth saving and luckily the government believes had the same idea and decided to protect um, the entire marine ecosystem there um, by preventing uh, any oil exploration into that area for forever. Um, so that is totally amazing. I know we need oil, but we don't need it that, that, that bad. So go Belize, and that's the power of really bringing attention to this because politicians tend to follow lead. Um, oh, and here's a good picture of those stalactites that I was talking about because uh, I, I figured you know not very many people are, are really able to picture what you'd be seeing down there. So uh, imagine that and then 40 meters above of you having Caribbean reef sharks. So pretty crazy stuff. Moving on to the Great Barrier Reef, everyone's favorite reef. Um, so here uh, there was, on, on the Great Barrier Reef, they're, they're putting out this project in 2018 just to try to collect larval um, corals. So if any, if any of you guys have been following what we've been doing, we work with Seacore International who does kind of the same thing. They collect uh, coral gametes, i.e. egg and sperm, from the water column. They mix them in the lab. They produce cute little baby corals, and they put them onto seeding units like this. They then put those seeding units out into the ocean. So when you're supporting us, that's really what you're supporting. The great thing is, is that uh, Australia and the Great Barrier Reef is beginning to take on this same uh, type of conservation work. I know that Seacor's been down there a few times to kind of help them with their methods down there. Um, and this project really is to collect hundreds of millions of, of baby, uh, baby corals, or in this case, egg and sperm, uh, mix them in the lab, and then have this huge uh, set of, of baby corals um, where they'll be testing them out on the reef to see you know, how they're responding to different things. This is kind of a preliminary stage, it seems to me, where they're collecting them in these things down here, which are kind of floating um, uh, boats type of thing. 
So basically, the, uh, the the corals will then hold in there. Divers will go and grab them out of there, and uh, um, at that point, they're going to be using these baby corals to test them against different algae types. So algae is actually a big competitor on the reef. So when these corals are so small and they're competing on these tiny little um, seeding uh, units, or in this case, probably on rocks and things like that. Um, they're actually competing with algaes for space, and the algaes will fight with the corals, the winner gets the spot. In some cases, there is types of algaes like this, like a coralline algae, uh, that actually attracts corals to areas and actually promotes them to settle. So it's kind of complicated, and that's the reason why um, these researchers are taking this huge data set of uh, baby corals to really test out um, um, how, how corals are re responding to different algae types. And then I think in the future, the idea is to really start getting these um, sexually propagated corals and putting them out on the reef. So another great story, um, for any of you who don't know, 2016 was a really, really rough year for the Great Barrier Reef. 2017 again was really, really rough. Um, over half the Great Barrier Reef has kind of been wiped out in the last few years. So it's really important uh, that, that, uh, that work's being done like this and it uh, really, really makes me happy to see that this type of uh, work that I believe in, this sexual reproduction work, is being applied um, worldwide because I th really think that it's the, uh, it's the future and it's really going to help these corals survive. Finally, this last one, and I remember when this coral, when this story came out because we must have gotten a hundred emails asking about it. You know, is this just sens uh, sensationalism or corals really growing 40 times faster? Uh, this seems like it's going to just save everything. And um, in my honest opinion, it seems like some pretty well-written uh, scientific uh, uh, literature, I guess well, that's not the word, you know, popular science articles um, where they kind of sensationalize things a little bit to get readers involved. And I'm totally cool with that. I, I, I think that, um, that the way that... that scientific articles are written is not made for the average person um, so we need to have this to help kind of decipher that data and get people excited about science so this article actually was talking about um, let me check his name again David Vaughn from Moat Laboratory which I believe is in Florida um, and what he found is when he was putting corals um, he was I think he believe I think he was pulling up a coral from the bottom of a vat and they were trying to grow these corals out so that they could take those fragments and put them out of the ocean and I think when he was pulling up the coral it broke and he found that those fragments that he left on the ground thinking that they weren't going to survive ended up growing way way faster um, so Eureka now we're going to have these corals growing 40 times faster um, and it's really a great trick to grow corals in captivity and get them out on the reefs and now we have a way where we know if we just frag them up or break them into little pieces we can get those corals to grow even better um, and even faster out on the reefs in this case 40 times faster uh, which I'm sure is species specific blah 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 but who cares um, that's not the point the point is does fragmentation actually increase the growth rate of these corals um, so if you come from the aquarium trade or the aquarium hobby um, I did. I, that was the, my first kind of look into this into this uh, environment. As a kid, I had a fish tank, and that kind of uh, was my window into the ocean. So that was actually the first um, the first way that I got introduced to this type of stuff. And to anyone from the aquarium trade, I'm sure um, all my fellow reefers out there are thinking, "Yeah, of course they're growing faster. Everybody knows that." Um, so in, in the aquarium trade, this happens all the time. It's people who own tanks, you know, their corals will grow out in a colony inside of their fish tank. Um, they'll break off a piece, they'll put it somewhere else, and that piece will really grow really quickly um, and kind of uh, create its own hold into the new aquarium that you put it into. So that's obviously what happened here um, where, where this kind of uh, stress response happened. So when the corals fragmented and they're small, it seems like they have this uh, kind of stress response and I'll have to find an article that really explains this and maybe I'll post it, but um, that's, the, that's the idea. You know, when the coral gets stressed out or it gets broken apart, it realizes it needs to put a lot of energy into growth right away um, so that it can, it can survive. And that's what David Vaughn is witnessing here in their labs. And maybe there was just kind of this, uh, uh, this disconnect between the aquarium trade 
and uh, the scientific, um, I mean, the, the actual research, um, which happens all the time. I doubt that's the case. I bet you this is just a little bit of uh, popular science writing. Nonetheless, it's great. Uh, and I hope that Moat has tons of success with growing corals uh, really quickly. So to kind of end things off, um, I just wanted to, I wanted to talk about these little uh, seeding units. I mean, sorry, uh, paper, seed paper infused turtles. I think that's what I'm calling them. So basically, <laughs> they're seeds that are infused in this paper. It's really cool. If you've ordered from us, you've probably gotten one or five of these. Um, in each one, there's these uh, uh, different species of pine tree uh, and white spruce. I think it's blue spruce, white spruce, white pine. Anyway, Canadian uh, Ontario species, um, really hardy native tree species that are in uh, this these seeds. And I was really wondering if anyone's actually been planting them and has actually seen a plant growth. If you did, and you can show me, send us a picture at uh, For The Reef. You can send it to Mitch Dender at ForTheReef.com. You can shoot us a, a picture on Instagram or Facebook. Just tag us. And, um, and, and I will happily send you a t-shirt as a thank you for uh, adding another tree to our awesome uh, province. So thanks, everybody. Uh, again, if you have any comments on this whole biotox idea, uh, if you like it, great. If you have questions, if you think it sucks, please let me know. Put the comments in. Uh, do what you got to do because uh, we would love to keep this going and uh, really continue to raise awareness long after the 2018 Year of the Reef. Um, I wish you guys a uh, happy new year and I hope that 2019 has nothing but positive stories for our planet's most critical aquatic ecosystem. Um, See you later.